The success of the Denevit Hartenberg relies upon correctly defining the coordinate frames at each joint of the manipulator. In this video, I'm going to lay out some of the rules that you must follow when defining the coordinate frames. And I'm going to give a few examples of how this works. In another video, you will see more examples of this as I show some complete examples of the Denevit Hartenberg method. There are different ways that the rules for defining coordinate frames can be expressed, but I'm going to define them in such a way that we end up having four rules. The first rule is a rule that we have seen before as a rule of thumb, simply for defining coordinate frames. Here in the Denevit Hartenberg method, it's no longer simply a rule of thumb, but it's a rule that must be followed. That rule is that the Z axis must also always be in the direction of the joint axis. That means that if you have a revolute joint, as shown here, the Z axis is the axis of rotation. So the rotation moves around uh, in this direction, and so the Z axis is up, as shown here. If the revolute joint looks like this, in this case, the Z axis would be pointing either into or out of the page because the direction of rotation is either this direction or this direction. For a prismatic joint, the z-axis is the direction of motion. Here I've shown a prismatic joint where the direction of motion is to the right. And so I will draw the z-axis as being to the right. The, z, the direction of the z-axis is always defined by the joint. Once we have the z-axis defined, then we move on to the x and y axes. Rule 2 concerns the definition of the x-axis. This rule says that the x-axis has to be perpendicular to both zn and zn minus 1. In this terminology, n represents the frame that we are currently drawing the uh, coordinate axes for, and n minus 1 refers to the coordinate frame immediately preceding the frame that we're currently drawing. I'll show you an example. Let's suppose that we are trying to draw the coordinate frames for the articulated manipulator shown here. I'll start at joint 0 and draw the 0 frame. The z0 axis is defined by rule number 1. However, rule number two does not define the direction of the x-axis for joint zero because I do not have a joint or a coordinate frame preceding this one. So I'll joint draw the x-axis in any direction I choose. Now, when I move on to the second joint, the z-axis is defined by rule one and the x-axis now will be defined by rule 2. The x-axis must be perpendicular to both zn, in this case z1, and zn minus 1, in this case z0. The direction that is perpendicular to both of these axes is either this direction or this direction. I can choose whichever one I want for the x-axis. In this case, I might choose the direction going to the right, and I'll call that x1. I've now satisfied both rule 1, that the z-axis must be in the direction of the joint axis, and rule 2, that the x-axis must be perpendicular to both zn and zn minus 1 for these two joints. I haven't yet drawn the y-axes, which are defined by rule number 3.
The third rule is also a rule that we have seen before, that the y-axis follows the right-hand rule now that we've defined the x-axis and the z-axis. The only one of the four rules which is significantly different than what we did in semester one in robotics is the fourth rule. The fourth rule is actually a restriction on the location of the center of the axis that we're currently drawing. This rule states that the xn axis must intersect the zn minus 1 axis. I'll show you an example of this. Here I've drawn an articulated manipulator with an offset. I'm going to start by drawing the axes defined by rules 1 through 3. First of all, the z axis is defined by the axis of rotation for the revolute joints. So here is z0, z1, and I'll just stick with the first two axes in this example. And I'll show you a complete example in the other video. The x axis for frame 0 is not defined, so I can put it anywhere I want. And the y axis is then defined by the right hand rule. For frame 1, the x axis has to be perpendicular to both z0 and z1. So it can go either to the right or to the left. I'm going to draw it to the right. Then, the y1 axis is defined by the right-hand rule, and that leaves it going down. I now have to check rule number 4. The xn axis, that is x1, must intersect the zn minus 1 axis, that is z1. In this case, we have not followed the rule. The z1 axis extends up and down to infinity in the location where we've drawn it. Same with the x-axis. It extends backwards and forwards to infinity where we've drawn it. And these two uh, axes do not ever intersect. It appears like they do right here. However, that's just an illusion of uh, due to the way that we've drawn it. If we physically had this manipulator in front of us, you can see that this joint, due to its offset, causes the x-axis to not ever intersect the z-axis. What we have to do in a case like this is we have to move the location of the center of the frame 1. We have to move the location of the center in such a way that that x1 axis will indeed intersect the z-axis. In this example, the way that we can do that is by moving the center of frame 1, which is currently at the center of the joint, over instead to the location of this offset. We can keep the axes in the same direction. We're just going to move the axes over. So I'm going to erase them here where we drew them initially. And I'm going to draw them over here instead. We've now satisfied rules 1 through 4 for the first two joints of this manipulator. The last thing I want to show you in this video is a particular caveat that will affect rule number 2, which is that the x-axis has to be perpendicular to both zn and zn minus 1. There are some cases in which there is no direction that is perpendicular to both the zn and zn minus 1. For example, in this example that I just showed, if we would move on and do uh, frame 2 as well, the z-axis would be defined in this direction. z2 and z1 
do not have any direction that is mutually perpendicular to both of them and also unique. In other words, when we were trying to define the x1 axis, we looked at z0 and z1 and we could see that there were only two options for which direction uh, x1 should be in. But when we look at z2 and z1, we could define the x-axis in any direction that is mutually perpendicular to both z1 and z2. And there are an infinite number of directions that satisfy this. I'm just drawing some of them on the screen here. In this case, the way we resolve this difficulty is that we define the x as being the direction that goes from the center or anywhere along the zn minus 1 axis to the zn axis. So in this case, the zn minus 1 axis is this axis right here, z1. And z2 is this axis right here. We're going to define the x2 axis as being along the line that goes from z1 to z2. And since that direction is this direction, this is what we will define as z2. I'm going to go back and add this little caveat to our rule number two. If there is no unique perpendicular, then x goes in the direction from zn minus 1 to zn. The last thing we have to do here is draw a frame on the end effector. As we've done previously, the end effector frame should match the frame immediately preceding it. So here we have x, y, z, 2, and I will simply duplicate this frame on the end effector. So this is the complete list of rules defining how axes must be defined in the Denevit-Hartenberg method.